Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin, and I am the events manager at the Cambridge Chamber of Commerce. I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Melissa this morning. Melissa Rode is a partner at the McGowan WLG Waterloo Regions Office, practicing in the Employment, Labor, and Equalities Group. Melissa regularly advises and represents private and public sector employees on a wide range of issues, including human rights, wrongful dismissals, employment contracts, grievance arbitrations, collective agreement negotiations, policy development, workplace investigations, and occupational health and safety. Melissa has appeared before administrative tribunals, arbitrators, courts, and mediators. While Melissa's practice encompasses many areas of labor and employment law, she has extensive experience uh, appearing before the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, helping her employer clients deal with claims of discrimination, accommodation, and harassment. Melissa is not only a human resources labor and employment lawyer, but also a trusted business advisor. She is always prepared to answer her clients' day-to-day -day inquiries as she recognizes the unique challenges of managing employees and maintaining a productive workplace. She can, can provide advice to her clients in both English and Spanish, which assists her in working effectively with all levels of management and various multinational corporations. Melissa also works with numerous employer groups and professional organizations, where she appears as a frequent speaker, providing strategic and proactive human resources advice. Today's session has been brought to you courtesy of our community partners, Graham Matthew, Gordon J. Wallace, Remax Realtor, Gowling WLG, NRC Initiatives, JD Development Group Corp, Jocelyn Insurance, Mitographics, Powerline Logistics Services, and RLB. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see my presentation and uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of good information to share today. I'm really excited to be here this morning. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Here we go. All right. Well, we're going to talk about return to office or return to workplace considerations, best practices for either remote workplaces or whatever your uh, company will be doing these days. And um, we would like to, I'd like to start with uh, giving you a very brief overview of what we're going to talk about. And these are the tips that we want to discuss about how to deal with the now. And the reason I'm saying the now is because some employers are choosing to have a return to the workplace or a return to the office. Some employers are choosing a hybrid model. Some employers are staying uh, um, working remotely. So we need to figure out how to do whatever is best for our business and for our employees. So some of the tips that we'll discuss in more detail uh, throughout the presentation today are the eight tips that we have on the slide right now. Um, we will be going into detail about each one of them so that you can get some tools uh, in your toolbox to hopefully go through this process uh, smoothly. Now, before we start with the presentation, and some of you might have seen this, I'd like to show you this video, which I think is an excellent video in describing how a lot of people feel like about going to back to work or going back to the workplace. Oh, and then that was not the video. Here we go. Oh. 
<laughs> this this video gets me every time. It, it certainly resonates with me. I wonder if it resonates with you. Um, for those of you who have already gone back to the workplace, you might have felt like this uh, already. And, and for those of you who have employees coming back, uh, think about how they might feel. And, and that's part of what we'll talk about today. Now, before we start delving into the details of what these uh, eight tips are all about, I'd also like to know a little bit more about you. So let's do this poll here. Um, if you were given the choice, how many days per week would you attend the physical workplace? All right, so everyone has responded and uh, I believe you can see the results there. Uh, there is, uh, the, the most popular choices are one, two or three days with 25% of those of you here choosing those and four and five is certainly the least popular answer. And we have seen this as part of um, larger um, statistics for, for the, the uh, workforce in general. And there's a reason for this. And we have to think about how this affects us when we're planning our return to the workplace uh, and, and whether we are able to, to go with things like one, two or three days a week. So, Let's start talking about our tips. Um, I might need some help from the chamber here as I'm not sure if I have to close this poll. You can just exit out of that, Melissa. Okay, perfect. Now my slides are not advancing now. Here we go, all right, <laughs> perfect. Apologies uh, about that, but um, so, so, but the first tip that we're giving you is to survey your team. You, you really need to start a conversation. It is very important to have this conversation with your employees because as you could see, even from the poll that we did today, there's a real divergence across workplaces on who would like to return and how many days a week. So share your thoughts and, and, and ask your employees what they think about to the extent that you can do it. There's gonna be workplaces where the return to the workplaces is, is inevitable or has already happened or it never ended, right? But for those places where there can be some flexibility, the best uh, course of action to take is to survey your workforce and find out what they want. If you feel comfortable, share your thoughts as well on the chat. And we will we will take a look at what you're telling us on the on the chat function here on Zoom, and I'll go over there to take a look in a few minutes. So, um, what do your employees like about working remotely? What do they not like? What do they miss about working in the office? And what is going to be their preferred choice? Now, just because you're asking them, it doesn't mean that you have to do it, but it will certainly help you with uh, the next steps that you're going to be taking. Now, once you survey your employees, then you want to make sure that uh, you are communicating your findings back to your team. This is very useful because your staff preferences should matter to the extent that it's possible um, in making decisions, but there needs to be an awareness and sensitive sensitivity to the fact that some jobs cannot be done remotely. So to the extent that jobs can be successfully transitioned to remote placements, it is vital to consider how these placements will continue in the future and what your, your, what your new workplace will look like and what, how, how long you're expecting to maintain this type of workplace. Whatever the situation that you come up with now, you need to be clear or, on whether it is temporary or whether you intend it to be permanent and whether your company can live with it permanently. So what are some of your companies doing? And again, um, I'd like to, is the chat function available on, on the group here? Yes, it is. Okay. 
I can't see it for some reason right now, but if, if, if we monitor and you let me know that there's comments or questions in the chat, then um, I'll, I'll be able to stop and go over them, okay? Would that Absolutely. be possible? Yeah, Thank that's you. no problem. All right, so, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of surveys out there that exist as a template and we're providing you in the slides here, we're providing you with some of those surveys. So I'll, I'll leave this up for a little bit so that you can get an idea of what might be out there. Um, just those are three samples that, that we, we have found. Ultimately, you want to compile your employees' thoughts, and ideally, it would be very useful to communicate your findings back to your team. Again, without any assurances necessarily that what your team wants is exactly what's going to happen, but it will provide a sense of more control and more value, and we'll talk about that with the next slide. This article that you can Google and access on, from Sue Bingham to make hybrid work solicit employees input really goes into detail uh, about what we just talked about. Uh, this is a great article. It explores how soliciting employee feedback on your future works, workspace is vital to ensuring your success. What we're seeing in the labor market is consistent with the message of this article. With workers having so many options in terms of workplaces, they're unlikely to stay employed um, at an organization that doesn't value their opinions. Because right now there is a, a real lack of, of, there's a real need for talent across companies because employees are leaving. And we'll talk more about that. But giving them uh, an opportunity to provide their input, it is, is more likely to have them employed for longer. People are leaving workplaces for reasons that we would not have imagined before. For example, some people are leaving the workplace because uh, they are not being offered a flexible work schedule or because they are only um, expected to be working from home and they wanna go back to the office, really we need to gauge what our employee population wants. So overall, this makes competition for talent really huge because we are seeing people um, that are really taking advantage of the fact that there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of differences across the board in organizations. Um, we're also seeing something else that the article notes, that the three days in the office, uh, two days remote work week is increasingly more popular as a choice. And we can see it as well from the, the little poll that we did. The majority of you would have liked just half or less than half of your days in the office or in the workplace than working remotely. Yeah, so... We need to not just focus on the location, but we also need to focus on the processes that we are implementing and the people to understand how to best achieve this balance uh, or a hybrid work model if we're able to offer one. As Sue Bingham says in this article, you have to start with um, certain steps for establishing schedules and making ongoing adjustments. You're going to start with number one, learning your team member circumstances for flourishing. Um, you want to be a connected manager. The times when the bosses did not know their employees or their subordinates no longer works. We're seeing uh, that people want to communicate with their managers and have their input valued. You're going to, number two, have to ensure clarity on business needs and then make your schedule accordingly. Ultimately, we all have a business to run and we have to meet customer expectations. And so those business needs have to be clear for everyone in when they're thinking about what they might or might not do when it comes to a hybrid workplace. And ultimately, employees and, ma and managers are like teachers and students in it to a certain extent, right? Bingham explores this phenomenon, which is known as the Pygmalion effect. And, um, and, and with this comes the, the concept that when we are looking for um, our employees' input and when we adjust employees' performance um, or expectations in a certain way, 
employees will adjust their performance positively or negatively to match the leader's expectations of them. Same thing, uh, so this is the Pygmalion effect. Positive expectations influence performance positively and negative expectations influence performance negatively. So we need to create clarity as to what the expectations are and which ones of those expectations can actually be met by our employees. We're also, as a third step, we're also going to have to seek insights into how well the schedule is working. So, you know, you could do this monthly or you could do it quarterly, but you want to find out what is working and what is not. And so when you're including employees in the process, you can't just do it at the beginning. You have to follow up and see what is working for them and for you as a business as well. Ultimately, like I said, just because you ask the questions, it doesn't mean that you have to meet every employee's wish list. So don't panic uh, about that and don't make it sound like that's what's going to happen when you seek or when you seek their input. With the hybrid workforce among us, we'll start to see businesses testing out their own systems. Uh, and there will be systems that work for certain cultures and there will be systems that don't work for others. Time will tell which businesses will succeed, but your system needs to have certain things to work, such as very clear expectations, not coming to the office, for instance, when you're asked to come to the office just because it is your remote work day doesn't work. So those type of things have to be clearly set out. Um, and, you know, another issue is that newer employees that are being hired during the pandemic um, may not be advancing as fast in performance as employees who are on board than in person. So we will have to keep talking about these issues and turning our minds to them so that we're not disadvantaging people who are taking advantage of a flexible workplace. I believe I see uh, a hand raise or a question. Um, yes, we do have a question in the chat, uh, Melissa. We have John asking if you have a percent uh, uh, stats or a percentage of people leaving jobs due to requirements of coming to work rather than remote. I don't have stats on that. Um, some of the information that I'm providing is a bit anecdotal based on what I hear from clients, but I don't have any stats in particular about who's leaving the, the workplace because they are required to come to the workplace, who, who, who is leaving their jobs because of that. I, I will provide you with, with some other interesting stats as we continue on. Okay. Um, So the second, the second tip that I want to discuss is with respect to reviewing your physical workspace, okay? So there's obviously health and safety modifications that uh, you need to consider if you're bringing people back to the workplace. So for instance, you need to consider your office layouts. Uh, things like office capacity limits or, or uh, other areas of the workplace with capacity limits, with six feet, six feet of distance between employees, uh, workplace safety barriers, um, you know, things that you can implement to, to help with the control and the spread of the virus. Um, the, the workplace safety barriers are largely here to stay for a while longer. So when we are investing on that, we can see it as part of what may stay forever as well. Um, this will lead to real issues when reimagining the workplace of the future, because we're going to have to see what of these things we will keep and what of these things will be time limited during the time of the pandemic where, for instance, where communal and open workspaces are the norm, these restrictions can represent a real challenge um, because we have to, for instance, implement huge sanitation procedures. If we're gonna have hoteling, for instance, of people coming into the workplace and using the same workstation, increased cleaning requirements, in addition to the suggestions that are listed on the slide, 
can really can lead to a psychological difference and provide employees with the peace of mind that their workplaces are safe. So there's a lot of things that you have to consider when bringing people back to the workplace to give them that peace of mind that they are in a healthy and safe workplace. And you also have to take these, these measures uh, based on the Occupational Health and Safety Act and your requirement to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of your workers. You're also going to have to focus on building certain health and safety modifications that may require you to include uh, third parties. Ventilation, for instance. Ventilation is a key component to protecting against the spread of COVID-19. Public health advice is to open windows, but this advice is not really useful in most workplaces as the windows cannot be open. So this is where the need for good ventilation arises. Filters can be backfilled into your existing systems, for example, HEPA filters, artificial filters. So you're gonna really have to consult with experts when it comes to this. Now I'm seeing there's a few more questions in the chat. Okay, and, and I see Nina. Thank you, Nina. You're helping out with those questions. Uh, Nina is one of my colleagues from Gowling. She is a partner also in the ELE employment group. Um, so I will, I see that that question has been answered. So I will keep going with uh, the third tip, which is reviewing your employees' remote workspaces. So this one is a little bit more challenging because you, you inevitably will feel that you have less control over your employees' workspaces. But, you know, working from home will have to fit everyone's particular circumstances and everyone's particular circumstances are different. A basic con concept is um, consistency in the quality of team members' technology and remote workspace setup, such that we can ensure that all of our employees are taking advantage of the same uh, technology and that they're able to perform the job uh, to an acceptable standards. For instance, you know, I have, I have dealt with a lot of clients that are experiencing issues with internet speeds, uh, especially um, when it comes to the download speeds that is required to run either a VPN system, um, or to run Zoom or whatever the system is that is needed for your workplace. So I've encountered situations where apparently the individuals say at the beginning of um, employment or during the recruitment process that they have the appropriate internet speed, but then they come into the, uh, into the role and they're not able to perform their duties properly because they didn't have it. Now, you know, just because we're, we experience issues where it seems like the employee is telling us one thing and doing something else, doesn't mean that they're actually trying to cheat the system. Uh, so IT is a huge technological area that many people are not aware of what to do. So we have to also provide IT supports to our employees. I'll give you an example with myself. I was having uh, real big issues connecting to the systems and um, having stability uh, with, with my connections. It turned out that it was an issue of my own networks. And if my IT department hadn't been able to help me with my own networks and what was happening was I was flipping back and forth between the two networks that I have in my house, I didn't know that was happening. So we got to really turn our mind to the fact that these people who are working from home may not be IT savvy and will need support. So we will need to provide IT supports to our employees. Will we put these IT requirements, for instance, into our telecommuting policy? Most likely recommended. Will we put the specific IT requirements into the employment contracts for individuals who are being hired to work remotely? Probably recommended as well. The other very important aspect that we need to review when we're dealing with remote works, workspaces is confidentiality. In business, as in law, confidentiality is paramount. 
So it is necessary to consider how confidentiality concerns will be addressed in a remote workspace and possibly a shared remote workspace, right? Is the employee sharing a, an office with another family member that is also working from home or attending school from home? It is also necessary to consider employees' privacy um, from the perspective that it can be distorted through the use of private cell phones and personal computers to do work. Are we going to provide them with equipment such that they have a clear division between their work uh, devices and their personal devices? Also for highly sensitive information um, that a company deals with, we have to think what supports will you give your employees to ensure that that confidentiality is being met. And, and that may include you know, providing them with additional filing cabinets or things like that, that will enable them or head, headphones that will enable them to maintain confidentiality and privacy uh, in their remote workspace. workspace. Also, and this is something that sometimes gets really overlooked, is inspections of your employees' workplaces, remote workplaces. You will have to determine whether you're gonna be conducting inspections, whether your inspections will be virtual, whether they will be in person, what areas of the house are you gonna have the right to inspect? You know, there's, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to a, a home office safety checklist. And um, in, you will notice that throughout the presentation, the slides will contain resources that you can rely on um, by Googling, for instance, Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety and Google Home Office Safety Checklist. You'll get to this website. Um, you can also click on the link uh, if you receive a, a PDF of the presentation later. So there's gonna be physical and emergency safety considerations that are gonna to have to be taken into account in remote workplaces. You have to consider whether your team members have the proper equipment, whether they have the proper safety plans in place to appropriately react to an emergency situation, for instance. You have to ensure that you have a procedure for contacting employees who face emergency situations in the remote workspaces. Uh, you have to consider lots of things like workstation design and arrangement, ergonomics, tripping hazards, home work environment. Uh, you're also going to have to consider work scheduling and distribution. And this is in particular very important when it comes to workload issues. Um, you've got to make sure that your employees are not being overworked or underworked. Um, and, and to do this, you're going to have to have clear expectations and objectives. You're going to have to have deadlines and, and consider all of these and communicate them very clearly so that you're not having overworked or underworked employees. You also have to consider that certain things that come with normal office functions are not necessarily being followed, like body breaks. You know, there's going to be a lack of body breaks for people who are sitting all day in front of the computer and perhaps not taking any breaks like you would in the office when you get up to get something from the printer or when you go to a colleague's office to have a quick chat. So other things to consider is who, who will provide what items, chairs, desks, computers, monitors, you know, office supplies, who's gonna pay for utilities or a portion of the utilities. Uh, there's a lot of OSHA and WSIV issues to consider when people are working from home. And you know, lastly, and this really leads me to the next point, you have to consider all of what working alone affects and all of what working alone means. Working alone is huge. Um, you should have check-ins with your employees, keep a contact schedule, and meet even if you have no work issues to discuss because you wanna make sure that those people who are working from home are also keeping engaged and keeping engaged with your company and feeling loyal to the company and feeling important in the company. So this leads me to the next slide, but I see that which is with respect to um, uh, checking in with your employees. And then I'll, I'll take on the questions after I finish with this uh, third tip. So uh, the other thing that you need to look at is the, the, the tools. The tools that were used at the start of the pandemic are not necessarily being used now. 
and some of them proved to be inadequate and remote work spaces have continued to evolve to meet those needs. For instance, you know, um, at the beginning, very few had a Zoom subscription. So 30 minute intervals was all you could do with Zoom. So remote workplaces have continued to evolve to meet those needs. So employers have subscribed to Zoom, to Microsoft uh, or Google Teams and have purchased technical equipment for employees. Some of them have, some of them have it. Employees have transitioned from makeshift office desk that had to be done very quickly and abruptly because we couldn't go to, to the workplace to more permanent in-home office solutions. So all of those things will be part of your regular check-ins um, because what worked before, it may not work now. So you wanna ask your employees, do they have all the tools that they need? Is there anything else that they require to do the work remotely? So before I move on to the next, um, the next topic, which is deciding on your vaccination policy, I'm gonna look at the questions in the chat and see if they've been answered. So I see that there's some more discussion between Nina and John. I think I'm more interested in workers who have been accustomed to working with interactions of being together. I think this is more of a, a discussion that, correct me if I'm wrong, John, by sending another question to the chat, but I think that this has been something that you've covered with, with Nina and the discussions. So uh, absent any other questions, then I'll move on to the next step, which is actually a huge one that there will be lots to talk about. And you know, you if you came to the prior webinar with my colleague Tushar, you would have gone into detail with respect to some of these things. But we'll talk a little bit in general right now. Um, vaccination rates as of yesterday in the province of Ontario are fairly high. And this is not only positive from an epidemiological perspective, obviously, but this is also helpful to make people feel comfortable because people feel more comfortable vaccinated. You know, the majority of the vaccinated population feels more comfortable when others are vaccinated too. So when we make people feel more comfortable, we are returning a little bit to some sense of dormancy. And, and this is a helpful exercise given uh, obviously the, the huge impact that the pandemic has had on, on mental health, which we will also talk about. So there's, there's stats for yesterday. Um, also, as I'm sure you are aware, um, we, we are looking at mandatory vaccination policies now uh, and, and, and or mandatory vaccination disclosure policies. And some of it comes from you know, the medical officer of health, uh, the government uh, pushing this uh, agenda forward, which is important to ensure the safety of our workplaces. When we're looking at mandatory vaccination policies or mandatory vaccination disclosure policies, the message is that vaccination status is no longer a private, very personal medical choice. The expectation in most workplaces will be that if you're returning to work, you are vaccinated. And that is consistent with the advice of public health. So what can you do when it comes to a vaccination policy? Uh, how, I, I wonder if you wanna share how many of you have implemented in your workplaces or have had uh, vaccination policies implemented in your workplaces. The majority of the workplaces are implementing vaccination policies. Um, the starting point should always be, what are you legally required to do? For instance, long-term care homes. Um, the Ontario government has put it this way, and I think it's great. Mandatory vaccines for all long-term care home staff are the latest tool to protect against outbreaks. This is a uh, for, for most, when we think about the crisis that we had in 2020 in long-term care homes, this is a much welcome step. So we have to think about what we're legally required to do. Um, hospitals uh, may also be seeing a, a mandatory vaccination requirement as well. Um, we are seeing that many hospitals are already doing it. 
and they're going with the actual mandatory vaccination, meaning there's a difference when, when we talk about mandatory vaccination policies, there's a difference between those ones who allow vaccination or, or, or alternatives, and those may not be truly mandatory, versus the ones that are saying, if you're not vaccinated, you will be suspended without pay and or terminated. And that is a true mandatory vaccination policy. Okay. So rapid antigen testing, which as many of you would know, is uh, something that has become quite a popular policy. It is financially feasible, right? It is usually part of the workplace vaccination policy. Rapid antigen tests are distributed through local chambers of commerce, like the uh, Cambridge Chamber of Commerce. And it's not necessary to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce in order to get the free testing kits, only to operate a business within the geographical region that covers that chamber. Uh, now, the efficacy of, of rapid antigen testing as a substitute to a vaccination is still to be seen. But this is becoming a standard for many businesses. Um, and, and a lot of businesses are saying, you're either going to have to vaccinate or you're going to have to submit to regular rapid antigen testing. Usually we see it as two times a week. There are companies that are doing it three times a week or more. And ultimately, if we have someone who is refusing to get vaccinated, and who's given alternatives such as rapid antigen testing and is refusing to go through rapid antigen testing. And this someone does not have any human rights protected grounds to refuse these steps. You know, it's becoming a little bit more standard for companies to say, well, then we're not gonna let you come to work. Now, workplace vaccination policies and rapid antigen testing is something that is being used a lot, but what's important to understand is that this is still unchartered territory. We don't know how judges are gonna go when it comes to vaccination policies and rapid antigen testing. With uncertainty, when we don't know, comes litigation. So we expect to see some cases move forward in the courts, but most likely the cases will come from the unionized sector where things can get expedited to arbitration. Um, when we start seeing terminations as a result of um, unwillingness to vaccinate. And I'm talking about unwillingness being very different from inability as a result of human rights protected grants. Overall, because of this huge uncertainty, don't take any negative steps against any employees for refusal to either vaccinate or take a test without first speaking to a lawyer, because there's a lot of nuances that you'll have to consider. And one of those big things is going to be exactly about deciding on your policy and whether you have made any decisions on your policy before you, you try to take any negative steps. So, you know, in the, in the common law provinces, um, we are dealing with exemptions to vaccination and rapid antigen testing typically limited to, to strict medical exemptions or sincerely held religious beliefs or creed. Um, but when, when it comes to, to creed, employers need to be very vigilant. You're going to have to ask a lot of questions of your employees because as the Human Rights Commission has said, um, personal beliefs are not protected under the code, right? A creed has to be um, a sincerely held belief, but it's not just my own personal belief. So we're going to have to inquire into things like what came first? Was your creed, were you part of this creed before, or was the decision to, to practice this creed or religion um, something that you practiced before, or is it after the adoption of your workplace vaccination policy that you have become part of this creed? And you may want to ask questions and follow up to that. You may want to get attestations from your employees. When it comes to all of these uh, human rights protected reasons, especially creed, you really, again, should consult with a lawyer and should ensure that you're satisfying yourself that uh, the requested exemptions actually fall within what they're saying. As for medical exemptions, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario 
the Ontario Medical Association and the Canadian Medical Association have all indicated that there's a clear intention to limit medical exemptions to the narrow grounds of allergic reactions to vaccine ingredients and supported by a specialist, an immunology or an allergist, uh, um, or, or where the individual experiences an adverse response to their vaccine, those related to uh, heart conditions. And, and the, the important part in all this too is that as I note in the, in the slides, um, it, the medical exemptions have to come from a healthcare pr practitioner that is qualified to opine on, on those things. So the note has to come from the right practitioner. A healthcare practitioner scope of practice refers to the type of medical work that they're regulated to do. So medical exemptions should be provided by a doctor or a specialist or possibly a nurse practitioner in some cases. Um, but you have probably heard a lot about chiropractors opposing the COVID vaccine on the news. And with respect to that, the College of Chiropractors in Ontario has made it clear that chiropractors are not licensed to deal with immunology or vaccination. Um, also, similarly to this, there's been some messages that certain uh, religions have put out as well, saying that there's nothing in their religion that would prevent vaccination. For instance, the Mennonite Church of Canada has uh, explained that, in fact, vaccination is consistent with the principle of love, love thy neighbor. So uh, we're seeing a lot of this, and this is helpful for businesses and employers uh, when we're seeing a, a denouncing of certain you know, claims that are being made that are not necessarily based on either creed, religion, or medical exemptions. So we got a decision to make. What are we going to do? Are we going to provide uh, a, a vaccination policy that requires vaccination with no alternatives? Are we going to give employees alternatives? Ultimately, when it comes to perhaps being in front of an adjudicator trying to, to um, decide whether we've had cost to terminate an employee's employment for refusing to follow the policy, the more choices that we provide, the more uh, chances we likely have of being seen as reasonable. So vaccinate or uh, undergo rapid antigen testing, or under, undergo an education program, there's different options and you'll have to decide on what fits your business. Ultimately, all of this is dealing with your existing employees and with the risk of either constructive dismissal or the risk of having to terminate your existing employees. But going forward, there's options to reduce liability. And those options are making COVID-19 vaccination and proof of vaccination a condition of hiring, for instance, or also a condition of promotional agreements moving forward. And, and again, those are a little bit more delicate and we would always encourage you to consult with council with respect to that. We're gonna move on to the next tip, which is with respect of uh, your remote workplace policies, but I'm gonna quickly check the chat. An opinion question. Do you think employers should be encouraging employees to work remotely? Well, this goes back, this is a question from, from John again. Um, this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. You, you need to see what your employees uh, want. You need to see what your business needs require. And you need to see where you can marry those two, right? So if your workplace allows uh, for a uh, full working remotely type of um, workplace, then you know you, you that might be your first step. And then you may want to get your employees' opinions. There has been companies that have gone completely remotely to reduce um, overhead, really, to reduce cost of office spaces and things like that. But again, you got to make sure that these employees are remaining engaged with your company because we are seeing a lot of employees leaving companies, um, either because they don't feel integrated or because they're not giving options. So that will be dependent on your circumstances and you'll have to get, you know, just use some of those resources uh, that we provide you on the slides to, to survey what your employees want. All right. 
So the next tip is with respect to drafting your remote workplace policies. And these statistics that are here, again, um, are, are very interesting because you know, we, we have 66% of Canadians that say that they're satisfied with their current virtual work from home arrangements. But then 63% want to return to their physical workplace or office space due to challenges such as virtual fatigue or mental health or social withdrawal. So that goes um, to the next stat that you have there, which clearly we have the majority of the employee population that has been surveyed by this uh, K, uh, KPMG study. Um, that believe that a hybrid workplace should be the new standard because we're addressing the issues of, you know, isolation, virtual fatigue, mental health, social withdrawal by being allowed or encouraged or required to go to the office half of the time. And then we're also providing with that additional flexibility. Um, and, and keep in mind what I said there, there's allowing, there's encouraging, and there's requiring. So again, you're gonna to have to see what works for your business. So there, at the end of the day, again, when it comes to remote workplace policies, you should ask questions of your employees and open up a dialogue uh, amongst your team. You are gonna to want to know um, what they want, and then you're going to also want to have clearly determined who does this remote workplace apply to. Um, you're going to make it clear as to how you're going to select people for working from home. Will there be certain times or dates or events that they have to attend? You should always have a requirement to come to the office as needed because ultimately, well, I, I shouldn't say should always, but you have to find a balance uh, because ultimately working from home does not mean not working. And if the business requires you to be available from, you know, eight to, to four, because that is when you service customers, an excuse of not being available uh, cannot lead you to not being able to come into work because if you are supposed to be available at, at home, you may have to come into work. So again, you're gonna to have to consider a lot of that. You may have to do cohorts. You may have to have different groups coming in at different times. You're gonna to have to consider the capacity of your workplace and to what capacity you can operate. And then you're gonna to have to consider things like um, bonuses or incentives. A lot, of, um, a lot of employers are providing signing bonuses so that they can attract new talent, but they, the flip side of that is providing retention bonuses to the people that are actually working and that have continued to work for you um, and, and, and that you want to show them that they're appreciated. Here is another great article um, uh, by Rita Tritcher. She's a Globe and Mail columnist. And um, she's, she talks about uh, the effect that this hybrid workplace is creating uh, on certain groups, including and specifically women. So we're gonna have to evaluate the, disproportion, the disproportionate impact that remote or hybrid workplaces may have on certain groups of employees. And, and women is one that has come to the forefront quite a bit. Um, Tritcher argues that a hybrid workspace will threaten to push working women farther off the leadership track at the office, since women are more likely to return to in-person work last because they have taken on more family and caregiving responsibilities during the pandemic. So, um, the, the, the author here calls on employers to make a concerted effort to accommodate women and keep the office from becoming an even more of a voice club. So some of the things that you're going to want to ask is who is actually making use of the remote function of a remote working uh, remote workspace or a hybrid workspace? Are those individuals still able to actively participate in the business culture? which is part of what we've been talking about throughout. Are they being passed on for certain coveted assignments or opportunities because they're not in the workplace? Employers will have to turn their mind to this and will have to make sure that none of this is actually happening. So um, 
we, we got to keep this in mind when we're dealing with a hybrid or remote workplace. There's lots of resources for you when it comes to remote workplace policy resources. The government of Ontario uh, has a lot of good resources. Um, the government of Canada and some of our local businesses, such as Community Tech, uh, have some resources that you can, you can um, explore. The sixth um, tip for you is to resurvey your team. It is important that every business fine tunes their policy and is prepared to adapt their policy. Planning is not enough. Employees needs will change rapidly and business needs will change rapidly. And you're gonna have to come back to your employees to see what is and is not working. And we talked about this before. We talked about the monthly check-ins or the quarterly check-ins. Your policies should also recognize that there's a need to adapt. So uh, we, we see a lot of acknowledgements in vaccination policies that the, that the policy may change with the pandemic or when the circumstances change. And so again, we're gonna need adjustments, they will be required and it's part of maintaining an engaged and happy workforce. The seventh tip is mental health. And this is the big elephant in the room. Employees' needs for mental health supports are at an all-time high, and they have to be addressed in order to guarantee a proper functioning team. Some companies are doing a terrific job at this, and some companies are not. But truthfully, the mental health crisis cannot be ignored. As you can see there on the stats, um, and this is from Stats Canada, there is probably more than one in five Canadian adults age 18 and older that have mental health issues because this stat uh, tested specifically for three mental disorders, which was major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety, and PTSD. Um, we know that the mental health crisis is huge from speaking to uh, those in the field. Uh, it is you know, virtually impossible to find uh, a psychologist, a therapist, a counselor. So, we really have to turn our minds to this and we have to be proactive in this. And this leads us to the next poll. And so we wanna know what mental health supports your workplace has implemented um, or is trying to implement to help employees throughout the pandemic. And some places might be doing all of it. Um, some places might be doing some of them but we're seeing that the more successful places are the ones that are doing the majority of these. So I'm gonna give a few minutes for everyone to respond on the poll. Or a few, not a few minutes, but. So it, it seems like the majority of the mental health supports that are being offered for those of you who are attending here is flexible scheduling. Um, I can say that there's been mostly the larger companies that have invested hugely on providing wellness activities, on providing mental health training, and providing more than flexible scheduling. Flexible scheduling may not be enough, right? And, and while it is a, a, certainly a positive step towards the mental health awareness and, and solution of, of some of the issues, it is not the only one. So we can close the poll because um, we will, I just wanna make sure that we have enough time to cover the rest of it. And I just have my last tip right now left, which is reconsidering employees' pays, okay? Um, as I mentioned before, this is a time of mass resignations. I have heard and seen the term that we are in the great resignation as opposed to the great recession. Um, there, is a challenge, uh, there is a talent shortage in most organizations, especially in professional industries. Pay increases and the addition of other employee benefits seem to be what employees want to retain employees. Um, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting uh, statistic here that one in five Canadians are planning on quitting unless there's a pay raise. And that's from just less than a month ago. So, you know, we, we really have to 
reevaluate our pay structure and our compensation structure. We have to consider uh, how we're compensating our employees, how we're compensating the ones that are working remotely, how we're compensating the ones that are coming into the office. And ultimately, we got to make sure that our employees are feeling valued and are feeling that they're well compensated. Otherwise, they will go somewhere else. So um, that is the last tip that I wanted to share that brings us to the end of the presentation. I wanna leave you with some other useful resources, uh, some of them from uh, our firm Gowling. There are great um, articles out there and we've also put some webinars out. Um, there is also some other useful resources from the government of Ontario and the government of Canada. And if you uh, are able to look at those in your own time, that would be fantastic. And now I would just like to know if there's any other questions for today. Okay. Well, if there, are, oh, there is one question. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we hopefully you found this to be informative and to uh, provide you with some tools to determine what your next steps are gonna be. There's a lot of homework to do when it comes to deciding on the return to the workplace, but it is doable. Uh, we can always help you through it as well. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that fantastic presentation. And thank you all for attending today's session. Um, and please note that the presentation will be made available on the Chamber's YouTube account. Thank you so much.